testing, testing. That works. Cool. Okay, let's go with my next speaker, Pat Turner. Hi, so my name's Matt Turner, and I work for Intel on the open source 3D driver. Um, as you might be able to tell, I have a cold. I'm sorry for my voice. Um, if it gets too bad, if you get tired of listening to me for my voice or for other reasons. We do have Ken waiting in the wings to take over. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the improvements that we've made to our GLSL compiler, both the, the high-level common code and, and also the 965 backend um, in the last year, and also um, what are our plans for, for the next year. So in the last year, we've actually done a ton of feature work, and it's probably some of the most exciting features that we've done maybe since we turned on GL 3.0. Um, Sandy Bridge, or I'm sorry, uh, Geometry Shader support landed for Ivy Bridge and Newer last October, um, which was the biggest piece of infrastructure that took us from GLSL 140 to 330. Um, recently, Sandy Bridge also got Geometry Shader support, which is great because now we have no platforms that support GL 3.1. Um, GL3.1 is particularly bad because it doesn't have the ability to, to select between uh, core and compatibility contexts, so it's really difficult to use. Um, <clears throat> we've also done a ton of uh, GL4 extensions. Um, probably the biggest two and most important are separate shader objects, which Ian finished, um, that did great things like made Sirius SAM 3 actually playable. Um, we also had a, a 
a pretty complete team effort on RBGP Shader 5, which is sort of the uh, everything but the kitchen sink extension in GL4. Um, so we've really made a lot of progress towards GL4.0. Um, we've also done a ton of work on new optimizations. And a, a lot of these are simple things like algebraic optimizations, like transforming x squared and x times x. Um, we've also done some neat things like we're able to combine multiple scalar operations into a single vector operation, which is something that we see really often from DX translated code. Um, and we finally have an implementation of common sub-expression elimination in the GLSL compiler. Um, but it's kind of limited because we're operating on trees and, and it's, it's sort of unfortunate. Um, but it's kind of been good because experiences like that have actually encouraged us to start working towards a non-tree based IR. Um, we've also made a bunch of improvements into the 965 backend and we've uh, added a lot of optimizations, probably more than in the, the main GLSL compiler, if for no other reason than we have an IR that's kind of usable. Um, another important one for, for DX programs is that we implemented a select peephole optimization. Um, so this, this handles things typically like, like ternary operations. Um, we've also made significant improvements to instruction scheduling and the register allocation code. Um, I rewrote the VEC4 and uh, scalar dead code elimination passes. We did have three. We're down to only two, and they work significantly better than before. Um, made lots of improvements to another optimization, register coalescing. Uh, and Ken and I added a VEC4 CSE pass. And we've also made other improvements to the general compiler infrastructure, things that don't necessarily uh, change the, the quality of the generated code. Um, but we've done things like we now preserve the control flow graph across the entire compile. So before we would just throw it away whenever we were done with it and regenerate it on demand. And now we do it once per program. Um, but in doing all of this work and coming up with ideas for new optimizations, we're beginning to realize more and more that even though we have a flat IR and that's what we want in the back end, we still need it to be SSA. Um, so we've implemented tons of new optimizations, but how do you actually measure that these are improving real applications? Um, ideally, you would benchmark all of the games and benchmarks that you cared about and statistically prove that your transformation of you know, x cubed uh, into x times x times x actually improves things. But this is really, really difficult for a lot of reasons. It's really time intensive. And in general, trying to benchmark games directly is, it leads to a lot of variability. Um, we can do things like we could replay API traces. That at least removes the variability, but it also has a bunch of problems. Like for instance, we've now traded all of the CPU load from the game for API trace just decompressing this eight gigabyte file. Um, so that doesn't really work either. Um, another problem is that the optimizations that we implement are quite often much too simple to actually be able to measure. Um, so the, the examples that I've given before, you'll probably never run your benchmarks enough to statistically prove that they've improved, uh, that they've actually uh, added any FPS. Um, but they're, they're obviously beneficial. So what we'd really like to do is to be able to measure improvements in the generated code directly. Um, and so what we did is we started collecting shaders from Steam games and benchmarks and other things. And we put them all into a couple of repos that we cleverly named ShaderDB. Um, and, and we added some scripts that would just run all of them, compile them, count the instructions, and then we've got some scripts that tell us interesting things about that data. Um, my local checkout right now has more than 19,000 shaders from probably every game that Ken has. Um, and, and unfortunately, a bunch of the games are, are proprietary, so we're not able to actually distribute them. So what we have is a public repo that has uh, freely distributable shaders from games like NextWiz, and also has scripts that do the interesting things. 
And then we have an internal shader DB that we, we clone into um, the, the open source DB. Um, and so shader DB is actually a huge improvement in, in our ability to measure things. It's relatively quick. I mean, it takes a couple of minutes to get results on my, on my laptop. Um, and from that I get huge, uh, I, I, I'm able to, to turn around optimizations very quickly and understand, you know, what happened with this one that it improved something or why did this not do what I expected. Um, so usually when we do shader DB results for some optimization, we include them in the commit log. So for instance, this is an optimization that Jordan implemented that recognized open coded lerp um, and actually replaced it with a real lerp instruction. So in this case, this is actually a, a really big performance, or this is actually a, a really good optimization, even though it only cut three quarters of a percent uh, of instructions. Um, most of the time you're, you're pretty satisfied with a tenth of a percent or a quarter of a percent or something like that. So this is really big. Um, the gained and lost numbers refer to uh, 7016 programs, which is something specific to 965. So uh, a quick explanation. 965's fragment shader can either operate on 8 or 16 fragments at a time. We typically compile the, the 78 program and then attempt to compile a 7016 program. And so if, if your program is simple enough that you're able to use effectively half of, <clears throat> effectively half of your register file, um, you can operate on 16 fragments at a time, which reduces some overhead and, and typically improves performance by about 15 or 20 percent. <clears throat> so in this case, this optimization reduced register usage in one program below some threshold such that we're able to now fit the program into 7016. Um, I mentioned that we, we get a lot of code from, from DX translators. Um, it's kind of interesting mining these things for, for gems like this. So I think this was from a Team Fortress 2 shader. Um, typically, the, the shaders look like they have already been register allocated. Um, they have names like R1 and R7. Uh, they use different components of the same variable for wildly different things. Um, so in this case, at first glance, it looks like, wait, aren't they just doing a square root? And you look at it a little bit closer, and it takes a while to really convince yourself of that. And it's the, it's the two operations um, right here that, that confuse things. So we're using r7.x, and then we're overwriting it before we do our last inverse square root. So this turns out to be kind of difficult for the compiler to see through. Um, we would really love it if the DX translators instead just, you know, gave us a square root. Um, well, because what they're doing is they're taking the, the DX bytecode that the DirectX generates and just doing the simple DOM translated DX instruction for DX instruction, and there is no square root in the DX. So you would, um, yeah, you're, you're probably right about that case. Um, DX9 assembly has some other operations that apparently people didn't figure out how to map well into GLSL. So, for instance, there's a compare. It takes three arguments and it basically selects on one condition. So, you know, this, is, this wasn't the output of, of some program. Someone actually wrote this. Someone implemented the compare instruction using this function. Um, if your backend is an array of structs backend, this is going to compile to at least eight instructions, and, and the IR is going to be sufficiently complicated that it'll be very difficult for your compiler to put this back together. Um, instead, you know, we could have just done a single line using a GLSL built-in. Um, and in that case, we would have only generated two instructions. Um, so, Perhaps because of a, a lot of code like this, or maybe in spite of it, 
Um, we've made some really significant improvements in our generated code over the last year. So I ran ShaderDB from, um, uh, on, on a version of Mesa uh, from October 18th of last year. It's on the commit where we turned on GL 3.3 support. Um, and then I ran it uh, at the beginning of October. The results are pretty fantastic. From, from a series of really tiny improvements, we've cut 17% of instructions and programs in a year. Um, that's, that's really huge. And the 7016 gains are pretty incredible as well. Um, in fact, we increased the number of 7016 programs from like 88%, which, you know, I'd give that a B plus, to almost all of them. Um, so we've made a lot of progress, and we've made a lot of progress by a number of different metrics. So just looking at, at programs, whether they were helped uh, or hurt or perhaps unchanged, there are almost none that are hurt. And if you look at the results of which ones are hurt, they're never hurt by more than two or three instructions. So very, very tiny, uh, a tiny number of programs that are hurt, and they're not hurt by much, as compared with you know, 43,000 programs that were helped. Um, we've also made some improvements that allow us to unroll a bunch more loops, so we've reduced the number of those by 10%, which is pretty great. Um, we've even cut the number of basic blocks by a comparable percentage with the number of instructions cut. Um, and because of the, the work to preserve the control flow graph, we've reduced the number of times we calculate uh, the CFG by 92%. And in a small example, the, the biggest shader in ShaderDB is one from the benchmark Unigen Heaven. And last year, it compiled to 7,900 instructions, and it took 14 seconds to do so, probably because it calculated the control flow graph 231 times. <laughs> so today, it's a significant improvement, but we're still not there. It compiles to 4,700 instructions in only three seconds, and it calculates the CFG once. Um, so, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of done bragging about what we've done over the last year. So, do we, do we have any questions at this point? So, you seem to be measuring um, how, try to measure the improvement you're doing by just looking at the number of restrictions you put. But the thing is, like, at least on in, in video IMD, uh, the solution space is not a linear solution space. Like for instance, if you have if you're using 16 register, and if you use one more, it's really bad. But if you're using 15 register and you just want one more and go to 16, it doesn't matter. So sometimes it's actually more interesting to redo the same computation and save one register. Sometimes it's better to actually save a computation. So like remove an instruction. And I was wondering if you had any you know, to actually know for sure that what, whatever you're doing is actually real optimization. Whereas like, for instance, a GPU simulator that's called multi 2 sim that does actually for AMD and partly, partially for NVIDIA, uh, real simulation with cycle resolution of the shader core. So you can actually know how many cycle a shader will take to execute, assuming the, the, the only thing where where it's not exactly accurate, it's like any memory access is actually bound. So you give a boundary on uh, the latency of memory access. So we, we have, uh, you're exactly right. It's, you know, performance is not directly correlated with number of instructions. Um, we have some tools for, for figuring out how long an individual shader takes. We have um, something that's called shader time which is just an environment variable, and when you set that, it, it inserts some atomic operations before and after the shader um, to, to get the clock cycles, and then it subtracts. Um, that, it's not ideal because the atomic operations add a lot of extra overhead. Um, so maybe your individual executions of, of a shader will, you'll get accurate results from, but it typically causes the benchmark to slow down a lot. Um, another difficult thing is that We've made these changes over a year, and so it's, it's really difficult to actually isolate all the compiler changes. I mean, I could, I could have spent a bunch of time backporting all the compiler changes to that version of Mesa and, and measured before and after. Um, I didn't quite think that was worth it, but um, 
and, and, and of course, we have had other optimizations, like we uh, recently stopped using the data port and started using the sampler um, for some certain types of messages and it improved performance of a benchmark by 400%. And that didn't change the number of instructions. Um, if you have suggestions about what we could do to actually benchmark stuff better, I would love it. So, so like I say, there is a project uh, run by one university and we have a partnership with AMD and some kind of partnership with NVIDIA. So it's multi two sim. Uh, we're doing a GPU emulation mostly for OpenCL, but you can still run shader and have a cycle accurate uh, view of how long shader would take to execute. So it's like it's just a C, C library really, so you can link to it and run shader. And I mean, it would be really nice if Intel just yeah. jump into the project and add. So the thing is like, AMD is giving some information about the how many cycle each interaction takes and stuff like that up to a certain point. So the accuracy is, is like it's more, it gives you some kind of boundary on, on the execution time of each shader. But it's not exactly accurate because they, they're very stuff where they don't give you good approximation because they don't want to give too much information. I so, love that. Um, it's, it's kind of unfortunate because we, uh, our documentation doesn't actually include the latency or issue time or anything for our instructions. So the, the information in our compiler about that and instruction scheduling has actually just been empirically determined. <laughs> So please convince someone at Intel to give us that information. That would be a, a, a big step forward. <laughs> <laughs> so one way you might be able to improve the shader DB um, in terms of representing how good things. <laughs> yeah, testing? OK. Uh, so one way we might be able to improve the quality of the shader DB output as far as representing performance is instead of just counting instructions, to get a dump from the um, instruction scheduler of its estimate of how long that shader is going to take. That estimate, of course, assumes that um, loops only happen once, um, but you know, it would certainly be a better measure of improvement than yep. what we're doing today of just counting instructions. And that maybe said, our hardware is our hardware. <laughs> the, the hardware, um, Come the, back the, to us, the instruction latencies are fairly consistent. Um, and these optimizations don't tend to um, do anything except for shorten the number of um, dependent instructions. So I feel fairly confident about them. Right, and that's that's kind of the the register usage case that that you were talking about is, you know, that it's, it can be fidgety around the, the number of registers. Yes. And that's, that's our main one yes. is if you kind of, if you go over that 50% threshold, then you lose 16 wide execution. And, and so we're able to, to track that and, and see those cases. Oh, and I've, I've written optimizations that have cut the number of instructions in the SIMD8 program and increased the register usage by probably one and caused us to lose the SIMD16 program. And then I have to determine is this actually an improvement? I mean, I've, I've cut instructions, but I'm, I'm losing, you know, this 15 or 20 percent, and that's probably not okay. Yeah, and, and, and in those cases, it also depends a lot on what the application is doing, because the, the hardware makes choices about whether it's actually going to execute you in 16 wide. So we might be losing 16 wide, but we, because of how the application is doing things, maybe the 16 wide shader wasn't happening very often anyway, so we didn't really lose anything. Another thing to note is that um, we've had so much low hanging fruit in, in the compiler in terms of new optimizations that we can do, um, that it's, it's really difficult to look at a shader and, and figure out what's the most important thing when you just see like 30 completely absurd instructions. Um, so just being able to cut out that noise and figure out where our performance bottlenecks is. You can't look at the output of a shader and not see yeah. things that could be fixed. <laughs> you just can't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one of the things that's worth noting is that um, in the past couple of years, we've seen just an explosion of new workloads that, uh, so in the old days, we had mostly just free software GL applications on Linux that had OpenGL paths that were natively written by sensible people. And now we're seeing a lot of stuff that's automatically translated from DirectX. So a lot of these 
shader patterns that we haven't recognized in the compiler in the past we, we just never saw before. Um, and so it's just sort of a growing pain of our compiler and that's, that's getting a lot better. I, I guess my question was related to that, which is you talked about a, a redistributable set of shaders. Does that exhibit similar trends, or is that the stuff that's come from open source programs and is differently affected by the, the performance boost? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't look at that. Um, that would be really easy to determine, though. I it can, would be great to know. Yeah, I can, I can do that. We get yelled at a lot more about Team Fortress 2 than we do about Sonic. <laughs> uh, just curious, on, on one of your slides, you had fail uh, 14. What is this? What are these fails? Oh, oh uh, yeah, lost yeah, this one right here, where yeah. where we've lost some some programs. It's it's occasionally very difficult to determine why we've actually lost a, a SMD sixteen program. Um, I haven't evaluated those. Um, in the process of doing this, I did I did find a number of programs that we'd hurt, and and realized that we'd messed up an optimization or something like that. So I went back and fixed that. Um, so. Just the, the process of, of checking our results from year to year has, has probably been beneficial. Um, so I'd like to do that. I'd like to go back and check and see if I can figure out is there something that is causing those 14 to, to break. But occasionally we do commit uh, some optimization pass that, for instance, you know, adds uh, 10 70 16 programs and loses one. You, you feel like that's, a, that's an acceptable trade off. So it could just be those. Are the uh, DirectX translators something that uh, folks could work on improving? That's a good question. Um, I have heard that there are some that are free software. I think they're actually from some Steam games. I, I'm not actually sure. Uh, whether or not you would be able to make modifications to those and then convince Valve to, to you know, reship TF2, I don't know. It would be nice. There are a lot of these these problems, like uh, like that one, that is much easier to fix in the actual GLSL translator than it is in our compiler. So, just a simple question. So you have a shadow DB inside Intel that is way bigger than the build one. Right. Would it be possible to, I don't know, I have some kind of server where you can send a binary that can be executed by Intel and can use the shared DB so that other people working on other GPU driver or other MISA driver can actually also use the same shared DB as you and get back results like so you won't have like people won't have access to the shared DB but they right. can trust that people can send a binary that can go through the through the list and execute using some kind of API. I don't know just the trick the tricky part of that Sorry, but... so the, the tricky part of that is we can't host any server inside Intel that can be accessed from outside Intel or people will come over and just fire us all. <laughs> and then we can't put this stuff on any server that's outside Intel's firewall either. So um, one thing that we have, you know, we've, we've had a cup, th this comes up a lot when, when we're talking about these things just among ourselves that we want to be able to, we keep building a bunch of this infrastructure that we can use and that, that helps us, and we want to be able to, to share a bunch of that and make some of these, these things accessible. Um, but the, the corporate goons make it really, really hard. And if, if we do something else, like if you, for instance, if you do a, a git pull of the MISA free and we add something to MISA so that you can actually run the shader who's having the hardware and run the shader compiler for each of the driver and then extract the information from all from the last git pull of MISA and it publish it, I don't know, by sending it by email or whatever, mm -hmm. would it be something possible? So like nobody will send binary and just be a computer inside Intel that's just do a git pool of MISA and... So part of what's hard with ShaderDB um, is that you have to go through this weird scraping process on the application. Um, you use this Mesa log functionality that outputs a bunch of shaders, and then you run it through some horrific scripts that I wrote that parse into a bunch of files, and it's all pretty terrible to work with. So, it, so it's really nice to have this like core shared set of shaders among the team. Um, but you know, we already have a tool for capturing GL output and replaying it. 
um, and we have ways to cut out um, like specific frames of that. So we could potentially restructure our shader DB as, hey, let's run a bunch of API traces with some environment variables set um, so that your driver dumps output about its shaders, um, which would capture a bunch of things that shader DB fails to capture about like what about when you have to recompile your program based on state. Um, and if we were basing around API traces, everybody probably has a bunch of applications and capturing API traces of them is pretty easy, at which point having the like global shared set of shaders becomes less important. Yeah, I mean, I think we could make a, a pretty significant improvement and perhaps short circuit a lot of this if we just <clears throat> went to the game developers and said, hey, we'd, we'd really like to work together with other people on improving the performance of your game. Could we distribute some API traces or some shaders from your games? So, yeah. Um, so maybe there are some that we can already distribute. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is all just stuff that we've ripped from various games and things that people owned. So they're not like any <coughs> Intel secrets or anything. It's just a matter of going and taking the traces of every game on the planet, which takes a while. Um, so whether we're doing API traces or dumping shaders, it's about the same amount of work. Other questions? Okay, so let me tell you about what we want to do in the next month, year, sometime. Um, we have historically been pretty reactionary. Um, a new game comes out and it doesn't work, it's slow, it renders improperly, and we drop what we're doing and go try to figure out what's wrong with it and fix it. Um, but today we've made enough improvements that when Steam games come out, they usually just work. And when they don't, it's usually a really small fix. So I think we're at the point where we can actually start to think about how can we prevent fires rather than putting them out. Um, and so I'd like to make some, some sort of longer term plans about things we'd like to invest in. And, and the thing um, that I really want to work on is new compiler infrastructure. So the lack of this has, has hurt us in the past. For instance, we had uh, actually a, a pair of dead code elimination passes that were written for the, the 965 fragment shader. Um, and they were written before we had a control flow graph. So one of them just walk the instruction list in order and when it found an instruction whose result wasn't used, it deleted it. So this seems fine, it works, um, it gets you the result that you want, but um, in a couple of cases we actually have maybe a string of 20 instructions whose ultimate result is unused. And so there were actually some programs that we ran 29 times through the optimization loop. And the only progress that we made was dead code elimination, you know, cutting off one or two instructions from this big chain every time. So once we had a control flow graph and we fixed dead code elimination to actually use it, um, it ran two times. It actually ran three and the third one doesn't make any progress, so it quits. Um, so in an ideal world, what are the things that we actually want? So in the 965 backend, we already have a flat IR, um, but we'd really like to have SSA. Um, SSA would make a bunch of our existing optimizations a lot more powerful and efficient. Um, it would also allow us to implement a bunch of neat and newer optimizations like global code motion, global value numbering, or divergence analysis, or something like that. Um, if we had SSA, we would also be able to implement an SSA-based register allocator, maybe. Um, the neat thing about this is that uh, people figured out if your program is an SSA form, you can actually register allocate in polynomial time rather than in, in P time. Um, it, it kind of relies on the fact that you have this idealized instruction set and idealized uh, register file where you don't have any weird restrictions or aliasing or things like that. And so it's, it's a little bit questionable whether the 965 driver could actually make use of it because maybe some things about the hardware prevent us from doing that. Um, it would certainly be neat to do. Um, also, if we're in SSA form, you can pretty trivially figure out your register usage. 
And if you have information about your register usage, that will improve your ability to do instruction scheduling. You know, do I minimize latency here, or do I need to actually minimize register usage? Um, it would also allow us to do a lot better uh, uh, with figuring out uh, how many uniforms to, to have the thread dispatcher push into registers before the thread starts. Um, and, and the GLSL compiler, the, this is the, the common code that's shared by all the drivers. Um, we really want to move to a flat, and why we're doing that, SSA-based IR. Um, because it would really be great if we could share a bunch of these optimizations. Um, it would also be great if we were able to translate this new IR both to and from TGSI. I, I'm kind of speaking for other people here, but I, I would imagine that there are some drivers that would like to not re-implement all of these optimizations. Um, if you could translate from TGSI back into some flat IR, you would just be able to reuse the optimizations. Um, you'd probably still have to have a lower level backend IR that handles your hardware craziness or whatever, but it should save you a bunch of time. Um, and also another problem that we've had with the tree-based IR is that really no one knows how to work with it. Um, I know G GCC has some kind of tree-based IR. I'm sure people smarter than me have figured out how to do it. Um, but when I pick up a compiler paper, it, it sort of assumes that you're operating on a flat list of instructions. So when you read one of these, it takes a while to understand, and then you spend even more time trying to figure out how do I fit this into a tree IR. Um, so if we had just a flat IR, this would allow people to actually just pick up a compiler paper, understand it, and then go off and implement the optimization. So I would hope that that would allow um, all, uh, other community members to, to start working in, in the, the compiler. Um, so that's sort of the, the problem space. Those are the things that we want to do. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Connor. I'll, I'll take questions if you have them after, after Connor talks. Um, spoiler alert, he's going to propose a solution. <laughs>